Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Tonight on NJTV News, building a wall against storm surges. Six years after Sandy Hoboken's finalizing plans for flood walls at its two weakest points. This conference takes a look back at how educational and medical institutions have helped to shape Camden and its revitalization. Jersey City starts early prep for the 2020 census. Amid concern, the new citizenship question could undermine the count. With six days to go before the election, a new poll has the race between Leonard Lance and Tom Malinowski essentially a toss-up. Plus, another tightest can be congressional race between Andy Kim and Tom MacArthur, who will debate tonight right here at 8. Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us. Heading into the home stretch of this election cycle, a key poll puts a battleground congressional district that's home to Trump National Golf Club in toss-up territory. The electoral excitement driven not so much by the candidates themselves as by Democrats' enthusiasm for sending President Trump a message in the seat of the summer White House. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron reports. About 50 volunteers were stuffing envelopes and making phone calls at Malinowski headquarters in Somerville today. There is incredible enthusiasm in the district, like nothing we've ever seen in the 7th District before. Congressman Lance spoke to a Rotary Club luncheon, then met us at his campaign headquarters in Westfield. The crowds are excellent, and we've been campaigning, and we had a debate this morning on the radio outside Hackettstown, New Jersey, on a, a local radio station. The new poll from Monmouth University has the race at Malinowski 47 percent to Lance 44, with a margin of error that makes it a statistical dead heat. We have polled ourselves, and, and we're ahead in our polls. This is a very competitive race, and uh, I'm campaigning as hard as I can because I think my views are the views of the overwhelming majority of the residents of this district. All the polls have said the same thing. It's a very close race. We're in a very good position to make a big statement for our district and for New Jersey. We asked what their closing arguments are. I have been a lifelong resident of this district. I know the district like the back of my hand, and my views on the major issues confronting the nation, health care, taxes, immigration, the international situation, are the views of the district. The closing message is that we need to elect a Congress that's going to stand up for New Jersey because we haven't actually gotten a fair shake from Washington for a long time. And we need to elect a Congress that's going to exercise checks and balances at a crazy, dangerous, mixed up time in our country's political history. With right wing violence in the headlines, the synagogue shootings, the pipe bombs, we wondered what impact that might have on who comes out to the polls. I'm uncomfortable making a political commentary about a crime like, like what happened in Pittsburgh and, and talking about whether it plays well or badly for one side or another. I do think, though, that th there, there are some very disturbing things happening in our country right now, with the president basically promoting crackpot conspiracy theories to divide and to scare the American people. We have to lower our uh, uh, shouting and screaming. I, I have always engaged in respect and civility. I do not favor shouting and screaming in any way, shape, or form. Some Democrats are saying President Trump's rhetoric is part of the equation. Yes, I'm saying the President of the United States is responsible for the tone of discourse. Every president is responsible for setting a tone. I lead by example in this area, and I wish that more people would be as respectful as I try to be. The Monmouth poll is virtually unchanged from the last one in September. Both men have hope. We're positive and optimistic. We're going to win. Uh, this will be a competitive race, but I've been in competitive races before. I think we're going to have the highest turnout in a midterm election in recent New Jersey history, and I think New Jersey is going to make a powerful statement, uh, not just for ourselves, but for the country. It looks like Lance's toughest race ever. For Malinowski, it's a chance to score an upset. 
In the 7th Congressional District, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. Tonight, candidates in another key congressional race that could reshape control of Congress will debate right here on NJTV. Two-term Republican Representative Tom MacArthur is being challenged by Democrat Andy Kim. The job of moderating falls to our senior correspondent, David Cruz, who joins us now. David, what is the state of the race right now? Mary Alice, um, the latest polling we have is from Monmouth University, and it has Andy Kim with a very slight lead, but it's within the margin of error. Uh, there's another model that shows him with a slightly larger lead if there is a larger Democratic Party uh, turnout, which, of course, is what they're hoping for. Um, you know, the, the district is kind of interesting because the east side, that is uh, Ocean County, went very big for Trump and uh, MacArthur in 2016. Uh, Burlington County, not so much. So it's uh, a big difference from when it was uh, 2016, when MacArthur won the district with about 60 percent of the vote. What are the biggest issues? Well, if you, if you uh, check the polling, health care is number one. Uh, there are about 140, over 140,000 seniors in the district, and uh, they're very concerned about their uh, health coverage. Uh, also in there is immigration, uh, and that is a, uh, an issue that the president has been stoking uh, over the past couple of weeks, and uh, that is a, a district that is mostly white and older, and it is an issue that is uh, important to them. Now, Texas is also on there, the, the president's uh, tax plan uh, and what its impact was on the district is also up there. And really, underlying all of this is uh, Donald Trump and his popularity or lack thereof. What can we expect from the debate itself? Well, it's going to be interesting because Tom MacArthur is a very aggressive debater and Andy Kim is a little more laid back and their appearances together in the past have uh, borne that out. It'll be interesting to me uh, to see how many, time the, uh, how many times the names Trump and uh, Nancy Pelosi are invoked tonight. The two people who are on every ballot in the country. Yep. <laughs> Thank you, David. And you can join the debate on air or online starting at 8 o'clock tonight. David Cruz is moderating the face-off between Republican incumbent Tom MacArthur and his Democratic challenger, Andy Kim. Things are looking up on the job front. Here with that and all the state's business news is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, new numbers on the job market show hiring remains strong. According to Roseland-based ADP and Moody's Analytics, private companies across the U.S. hired 227,000 people this month. That is more than expected. ADP's report always precedes the government's monthly jobs report, which comes out Friday. It's also expected to show steady hiring. And workers are finally seeing a decent bump in their paychecks. The Labor Department says on a yearly basis, Wages and salaries are now up 3.1 percent, the biggest increase in a decade. But in Atlantic City, casino employment dipped this fall. The Press of Atlantic City examined data from the state that showed employment dropped 4.5 percent last month from its peak in the summer of 2017. Both full and part-time employment dropped. One expert told the paper that the addition of sports betting could boost hiring in the months ahead. Governor Phil Murphy has released his 2017 tax return, which shows income of nearly $6.8 million last year. The governor and his wife paid nearly $2.2 million in federal taxes. The Murphy's income included about a $1 million in dividends and $5.8 million in capital gains. In the prior year, the governor reported income of $4.6 million. Governor Murphy took a swipe at President Trump as he released his tax return. The governor said in stark contrast to the president, he believes New Jerseyans have a right to transparency and openness. A Republican state lawmaker is pushing for tax cuts for the middle class. Assemblyman Anthony Bucco introduced several tax cut bills at the beginning of the year. And now, according to NJ Spotlight, he's challenging Democratic leaders to take a fresh look at them. The assemblyman has renewed his push after a report by the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy found that middle-income taxpayers in the state pay a higher effective tax rate than the wealthy. One of the bills introduced by the assemblyman would link the state's income tax brackets to inflation. Today marks the end of a very ugly month for Wall Street as stock suffered steep losses in October. The Dow fell 5 percent. The S&P 500 dropped 7 percent, its biggest monthly loss in seven years. And the Nasdaq fell 9 percent, its worst month in a decade. 
Today, however, the markets did close higher. The Dow climbed 241 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report is provided by Verizon and New Jersey Tourism Industry Association, announcing its annual New Jersey Conference on Tourism, December 5th and 6th at Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. Online at njtia.com. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSE&G, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Building a wall, that's the basis of an ambitious plan six years after Sandy to protect Jersey City, Hoboken, and Weehawken neighborhoods from again being inundated by storm surges. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan has this report on efforts to tackle the peril and promise the challenge of climate change. Hoboken's northern flood wall will start at Weehawken Cove when Sandy surged into the vulnerable city six years ago, causing $100 million worth of damage. This was one of two places it breached the waterfront. So engineers designed an elevated park-like barrier here. A more conventional flood wall will then follow Garden Street through an alley to Washington and will feature retractable barriers. Some residents wonder. I think it's hard to blend in a wall. That's just going to go, you know, from up here all the way downtown. It, that's something that I think they'll have to hire really good architects or designers to try to design. What is it going to look like? Is it going to be a big metal thing? On Washington Street, because of the natural topography, the wall will be down as low as three feet. And it will be integrated with benches and seating. That's the plan to make it be part of normal everyday life as well as something that protects us during storm surge conditions and extreme weather events. Alan Kratz heads the innovative Rebuild by Design project which won a $230 million federal grant to defend Hoboken against floods. Two-thirds of the city lies in FEMA's flood zone. After a couple years of community input and some serious disagreements, city, state and federal officials settled on final designs last week. It's a scaled back compromise. We want to have flood protection, but we want it done in a way that blends seamlessly into the urban landscape. You might not even realize that uh, the park bench that you're sitting on is designed in a way to actually protect against the 100-year storm. Mayor Ravi Bala says the city's southern flood wall, called the Middle Ground Design, will integrate a plan to develop 2.3 million square feet of commercial and residential space along Observer Highway, but still protect New Jersey Transit's rail yard near the train station. Station. The Hoboken Terminal is the, um, the nucleus of mass transit infrastructure in New Jersey, where you have no less than five forms of mass transit infrastructure. The opportunities for economic development at that location are hugely enormous and, and, and beneficial to New Jersey. The project includes other defenses like parks to absorb flood water, retention basins to store it, and sewage infrastructure to discharge it. But it's the walls that people will notice. Residents will get to comment again in February. Safety first, you know, I mean, you'll have your home. Afterwards, the view can always be repaired. Construction scheduled to start by the end of next year. The project must be completed by September 2022. That's a hard deadline that's directly connected to the federal funding. In Hoboken, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Construction in Camden is booming, but the key to reconstructing the city is building a trained workforce to fuel new industries there. Leah Mishkin reports. If you're going to grow as a city, if you're going to become that regional icon that Camden once was, albeit through different means, then you've got to have the, the capacity to, to deliver. At this New Jersey Business and Industry Association event, keynote speaker Louis Bezich explained Camden lost half of its manufacturing jobs and most of its middle class between 1950 and 1970. The key to rebuilding was in the city's anchor institutions, Camden's higher education and health care facilities. We made the case that if the state was going to invest any money in the city, that it would get the biggest bang for its buck, it would get a great return on investment if there was some investment in ends and meds. He says one of the critical first steps in the evolution of Eds and Meds was a 2002 economic stimulus package that laid the groundwork to get Camden to where it is now. Eds and Meds, uh, number one, uh, are a magnet for both economic growth in terms of the number of people we employ, in terms of our capital and operating budgets, in terms of uh, 
uh, the business we throw off to, to Camden businesses, uh, and of course all the people that we employ. And in addition to that, we literally bring people to Camden, uh, whether they come here for their education or they come here for their health care. Nine anchor institutions, including CamCare, Camden County College, and Cooper University Healthcare, form a task force. They have a more than $2 billion economic impact on Camden alone, according to NJBIA. The institutions provide nearly 55% of the jobs in the city, with the help of other agencies, according to the Camden Higher Education and Healthcare Task Force. So I would argue, as one who's studied public policy, that it's totally appropriate and in many ways um, necessary for the government to work with the private sector to revitalize the city. Former Camden Mayor Dana Red says education and medical institutions are creating a bio hub, not just for Camden, but all of South Jersey. We are currently in the third phase of our Eds and Meds evolution. Uh, currently under construction is the Joint Health Sciences Center, uh, which is a project of the Rowan University Rutgers Camden Board of Governors. And we're looking to open our facility with all of our academic partners in mid-2019. And we also have under construction, uh, or in consideration, if you will, Rutgers is uh, looking at building a new business school uh, along the corridor. And so we're filling the gap, if you will. Uh, in the city of Camden. Congressman Donald Norcross says South Jersey will also be fueled by the Opportunity Zones program, which gives tax breaks to companies who invest in certain communities over a period of time. In Camden, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. NJ Transit got a jump on Halloween. That tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Kearney, where for the second night in a row, the rail line delivered another nightmare commute. This time, because the decrepit portal bridge across the Hackensack stuck in the open position, inflicting up to 90-minute delays, igniting tempers among put-upon commuters, and triggering a tersely worded statement from Governor Murphy to the effect that the state's committed $600 million to build a new bridge, which is fully permitted and shovel-ready and delayed only because the Trump administration is not doing its share. Next to Atlantic City, where the Claridge Hotel is taking the lead among hospitality companies in banning those plastic straws so damaging to marine life. The former casino property, which now operates as a non-gambling hotel, is one of four owned by TJM Hotels and Resorts. It also owns a Radisson and two Crown Plazas in the Northeast. The straw ban takes effect next year as part of a larger sustainability project the company plans to launch in 2020. Finally, Kearney's Point, where residents are launching howls of complaints about a mystery sound floating across the Delaware. It started last summer, but is reaching a crescendo in recent weeks. Locals describe it as a sickening, pulsing heartbeat, a repetitive, dull bass that pulsates through homes and rattles residents' nerves from early evening to as late as 4 a.m. From a party boat, an anchored dredge, a riverfront nightclub on the Delaware side? Residents are aggravated, police are frustrated, and Delaware authorities say they're working on discovering that thing that goes thump in the night. And that's our Garden State Express for Wednesday, October 31st. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. Back-to-back -back shootings have shaken Jersey City. Last week, 17-year-old Lincoln High School student Jade Saunders was shot and killed. Just over 24 hours later, another woman and a two-year-old boy were shot and injured. Still, the city's mayor's optimistic gun violence is on the decline. Let me start with the last five years. I think you would say that gun violence is certainly trending uh, downwards in the city, and it never trends in an absolute straight direction. You see occasional blips up and down, and you look at the overall trend. Um, this year so far has been a very, very good year. The last two weeks has been extremely disheartening and concerning. 
Also concerning to Mayor Fulop, the Trump administration's addition of a citizenship question on census forms. A dozen states and big cities, among others, are scheduled in federal court next week, arguing the question will discourage immigrants from being counted and dilute both political representation and federal dollars for states like New Jersey that tend to vote Democratic. Here's Brianna Venosi. There's a lot at stake in the upcoming census count. The population numbers produced by the survey are used for everything from drawing political districts to distributing government money. And those involved say the Trump administration's proposal to include a citizenship question in the 2020 count poses a real threat to its accuracy. We're not involved in that decision making, of course, so we're moving forward assuming it's on the, on the, the 2020 questionnaire. Our job doesn't change, though. On the current surveys we conduct, there is a, a large distrust in government. And we see that every day as we're out there knocking on doors, collecting important information for other federal agencies. Jersey City is widely considered the most diverse in the state, making it all the harder to count. As a head start, a U.S. Census Bureau office will open here by mid-2019. Mayor Steve Fulop is one of dozens signing a U.S. Conference of Mayors letter against the citizenship question, with concern about a repeat from 2010, where he says the town lost out on millions of dollars. 2010, Jersey City and Hudson County in particular had one of the largest undercounts in the entire country. And uh, it's significant because it impacts us in a lot of different ways. It impacts us in our schools. It impacts us with our police. It impacts us with fire. It impacts us with our congressional districts. It is estimated that the state of New, Jer New, state of New Jersey receives over $18 billion of funding every year for the largest 16 programs based upon census data. So we need to get it right. But that'll be tough without community buy-in. So the city will hold six town hall meetings, set up kiosks with community leaders to explain how the survey works, what the census is and what it's not. We don't ask for Social Security numbers. We don't ask for bank account information. We never ask for money. And we cannot, I can't reiterate enough, Title 13 protects everyone's data. We cannot share it with any other agency, with any other private organization. That might be the biggest takeaway. Contrary to popular belief, the census can't share your information. The agency is also looking to hire managers and clerical workers to run the future offices, and they'll pay 22 bucks an hour. Fulop says the title as the state's largest city is on the line. Newark still holds that one. In 2010, the survey put Jersey City's population just over 247,000. But today, Fulop estimated it to be closer to 305. So Mayor Fulop says the community engagement portion of this will begin immediately. There's a town hall scheduled in Greenville for tomorrow night. The census is already recruiting workers with the count slated for April 1st. In Jersey City, Brianna Venosi, NJTV News. some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. A Monmouth poll shows Andy Kim leading Tom MacArthur in New Jersey Congressional District 3, 48 percent to 46 percent among likely voters. 75 municipalities in New Jersey have at least one opportunity zone. Patterson is New Jersey's third largest city behind Newark and Jersey City, and Hoboken was originally an island until it was filled in in the 20th century to facilitate further development. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, why are so many babies born too small too soon? A partnership to reverse preterm births. And at 8 o'clock tonight, Tom MacArthur and Andy Kim square off right here in our final debate ahead of the midterm elections. You can join in on air or online. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, happy Halloween. See you in a bit. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. 
NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Lead funding for Peril and Promise is provided by Dr. P. Roy Vagalos and Diana T. Vagalos. Major support is provided by the Mark Haas Foundation and Sue and Edgar Wachenheim III. PSE&G is building New Jersey's clean energy future. We're working to protect our network against extreme weather, expanding and upgrading transmission lines, and modernizing our natural gas system by installing new, more durable underground pipes. At PSE&G, our goal is to make sure you have the safe, reliable energy you need to power your life now and into the future. In every county across the state. I do like that Horizon is a Jersey company. It's almost like a sports team for us. It's like ours. In sickness and in health. You never think it's gonna happen to you, especially being so young. Horizon has been there for me through everything I've been through. With experience and stability, we're behind you. You know, we're hardworking people in New Jersey. Horizon gets us.